welcome and thanks for joining us today. We have been here before uh, several times in discussing very difficult, important subject. And today, really, what we want to discuss is around implication of AI. I know AI is one of the topics that we all discuss in our CEO meetings, top management meetings, and engineering meetings, all the way to everybody else that are out there. So what I'd like to do today is really talk about the, some of the uh, strategies that Samsung Edge, what are some of the things we want to work on, as well as what are some of the key questions we should address as a tech uh, community. I am very concerned that as we are paving and data-driven economy with AI, are we really shaping our future properly with the kind of tools, kind of investment, kind of technology that are being responsible? And I think all of us in this room, most of us that are driving in Silicon Valley have a responsibility for not only pushing technology, but making sure it's responsible for that technology as well. So let me kind of go back to where we were at the last meeting, which where I said data will generate whole new economy, just like we have seen the, what happened in 19th century with oil. And I don't remember how many of you were in that meeting last year, but I did say that uh, if you look at the, the kind of companies that are contributing in just 10 years ago, uh, top five out of 10 companies were oil companies. And you can see in this list, they were very powerful, very big. And if you look at today, you can see that um, the number of companies in 2018, if you look at the top 10 list, there isn't too many oil companies out there. In fact, there are new category of companies that are driving new economy, and they're called tech companies and platform companies. And the, uh, if you look at the number, actually it's a seven out of 10 is now tech companies that are driving our economy. In fact, two of them was recently passed trillion market cap. So it is an incredible uh, time that we're living in. I think part of that is because in 19th century, what drove the economy was actually physical goods, right? It's the products and it's generating the engine to fuel all of our kind of engines, the muscles that we need to transport, to move things. Today, the data is a intangible. It is a something you can create in an insatiable way to create the insatiable demand for solutions that we are all looking. So in some ways, their ability to generate business and creation of new, new opportunity is even bigger than we, where we had been in the past. So if data is the oil, AI is the engine. I know it's a bit of a metaphor here, but at the end of the day, AI is a very critical part of dealing with this vast data we are living with. And so I think that, um, that it is not a uh, overstatement there saying AI is shaping our future, future of our industry from retails to entertainment, to communication, to enterprise. So it's really interesting to see it's not just the new companies that are out there, but it's also companies that's been out there for a long time. Industry that we are used to is disrupting everything that we know it, from the hotel chains that are simplifying the bookings, like Oya, all the trucking companies that are out there in China, basically connecting the five million drivers. I think out of five million, over three million of them are independent drivers. And half of them carry their logo, carry their products in one way, and then come back empty by optimizing not only their navigation around the weather, but also making sure when they're returning, being able to pick up the right load so they can be able to optimize their productivity. And these type of things are changing every industry that we know it. So I know that I'm not trying to oversell AI, but I do think the data-driven industry with AI will disrupt everything that we are dealing with as well as the infrastructure companies that are supporting it because of the data, now data centers are going to change, and that are fueling those things to be semiconductor companies. So we are in the midst of a huge change. It's really exciting time to be in where we are to see these changes. But at the same time, as we are excited about these changes, I think there are three things that I want to pay our attention and get our discussions going today. And one of them is really around uh, people. So let's ask this question around, do we think that our uh, 
folks are ready to deal with AI? Do we have the right education to support the kind of demand that we require? Can you raise a hand, please, if you believe so? It's concerning. <laughs> how, how many of you believe that digital divide will increase? Raise hand, please. Another concerning. And how many of you think that AI and smart machine will reduce jobs? Right? So these are all the questions I think we need to think about with a purpose, because these things matter. We may be very busy in solving some of our applications, maybe making better chips, better data centers, but at the end of the day, all these strategic questions we're discussing will impact our society and impact all of us that are in this room. So at Samsung, our mission is really about enriching people's lives and contribute to society through better technology and products and design. So in my job, I think about what are the future opportunities for not only today, but next five years, 10 years, and 15 years. And two areas that I believe the AI has a profound impact on how we live, and I want to talk a little bit about that as there will be more discussion from our speakers later on. One of them is really around healthcare. And clearly, it's something that has been in my radar for the last five years. And if you've been to our CEO Summit, we've been discussing this subject for the last five years, actually, as a subject. As we are living longer, in fact, we expect one out of three in this room will live. And in fact, one out of three people on Earth will be over 60 in by 2040. So that just shows we are in very much aging society, living longer, which means tremendous opportunity for care that have to be addressed through technology, not spending more money. Today, our GMP spending on health care is 18% of our GDP. So you only expect that it will continue to increase, not decrease. So I was thinking, how can tech can be able to contribute to this? I believe IT can help and contribute to better health care. And that's a very important thesis and assumption, but I think that uh, there is a, some very promising progress that are being made, and I'm sure definitely we'll be discussing some more examples around that. So I was going to just say that if you think about tech, if you think about your phones, your computers, we're expecting like what we have done with our most law, right? Basically, we're getting the uh, almost doubling capacity every two years and being able to give you the kind of power performance as well as the cost we're used to. Can we expect the same kind of benefit in health? And it turned out, I didn't really know this, but it turns out there is another law called the IRAMS law, which is about the, a, a, the cost of drug discovery. It's actually much different than what we used in Moore's law. It doubles in terms of the cost. It doubles in terms of time. So we are already, a, uh, it seems to me, already picked a lot of low hanging fruits. And the problem of the speed and money, which costs now $2.5 billion to discover a new treatment. And by global perspective, this is a big problem. And the expectation is that uh, our healthcare costs will go up to $18 trillion by 2040. That is an unbelievable number because that is the size of the US economy. So we are all going to be working for healthcare. And the, uh, there is some promising things that we see as we are dealing with these issues. We see the life not only as a, as a terms of tissues, organs, and the more as the organic material, but also we are a digital being. Life is just uh, not just organic, but it's the uh, digital, and digital code written into our DNA. Uh, but A, T, G, C, G, and I'm not an genetic expert, but it turned out we are all made out of similar code. And as I'm walking here, as I'm talking, and as, as I am discussing, I am actually creating even more of myself, more data through this process. So I think that um, genome is a very important part of a bridge, knowing more about us, knowing more about where we are from, knowing more about what we don't know, and knowing about the, um, the next step around the more information through uh, things like blood. You know, the viral of blood contains one terabyte of blood. And if you think about Samsung's products, typically one terabyte is one of the small 
to a small 2.5 inch drive. But that's the kind of data that are coming out of this viral blood. They can really give us an insight, especially if you are a cancer patient and looking at those blood changes that are over time, the DNA changes, it needs ch mutates over time. As it happens, you can see the kind of changes that can help us to know more about our body. So I think with that data, with AI, and over time, we can be able to make more sense about our selves, and in the process, I believe that we can be able to make a bigger impact in our lives. The other thing that I'm passionate about is really about autonomous driving, and I know all of us think about this as a headline. The question is, when will autonomous driving be ready? And I was more optimistic about this initially, the more I get to know about this, I'm realizing it's going to take even more time than I thought. There are a lot more challenges than just having the car driving. It's a lot to do with just the way our infrastructure is, the way the people drive, the way the road conditions, and the way the technology evolution. And also mostly, it also costs a lot of money to develop these technologies to be useful as today. It also requires a a, a um, collaboration between partners. There is no standardization, no modularity, so it's not a good way to even simulate the kind of data that we see. So it's everybody de developing data on, and I think everybody realizing that it's really expensive. It's costing a lot of money. It's gonna take some time. And then making sure that the last 1%, the safety, it's hard to guarantee, and as you know, if you have one accident, it's going to be front page news for any brand company. So that also takes a lot of uh, issues. But I am very optimistic that we are going to make a lot of progress on this. It's a matter of time. But it requires the kind of work we have done in the past. Let's think about mobile 1.0. The phones that we, you all have in your phones didn't happen ex, you know, just overnight. It, it happens over time. It requires a making sure that we had a common connectivity. Even some years ago, we used to have a different standard. We used to have a GSM, we used to have a CDMA, WCDMA, and all these different standards came over time, became Edge One. And then just think about the OS, the apps. These things would not have been happen if you had a separate OSs and app, app, app applications. And then batteries. You know, we used to take 30 minutes to have your mobile phones in 1984 when the, I think it's Goldie Gecko used that uh, phones in his Wall Street with a Motorola phone. But today, now, we can use it pretty much all day. And that's the kind of mobility that we have made a progress on. I'm using this as an analogy because I think where we are going with the mobility 2.0 is also the same kind of challenges. We need to address the common issues, not only in architecture in the car, with the common architecture, modularity, standardization, uh, common AI, common standard interface to move things. That's the only way we can reduce overall cost and effectively improve this uh, approach that we're doing, but also you need infrastructure like 5G and B2X and open platforms, simulation tools. So there's a lot of opportunities for the room, folks in this room, but also it's a challenge that we, we have to overcome. And I think these are the things that we have to deal with. So what are we trying to do at Samsung? What we are trying to do is really start with strengths of our semiconductor business. Being a number one semiconductor in the world, we're going to continue to invest in semiconductor, making sure we have the leading edge process, continue to push the nanometer, nanometer geometry, but also making sure we have the right architecture that can support the data that are required in this type of new environment for data centers as well as the applications, and then making sure we have the right 5G connectivity that are being able to support the kind of latency, kind of throughput that are required to support the future applications. And I think that um, one of the very important, important things we have to recognize architecturally is really the, just like we have seen in mainframe days, it used to be all coming into center, and then as the PCs come out, we have the decentralized architecture. We are back into this hyperscale days where all the apps are going back up to the cloud, but I believe the edge is going to become very important. Every edge is going to become very important processing node that are being able to collect the data, ingest data, and send what makes sense to be able to address the kind of bandwidth required. Just think about a car. Car alone will generate 
uh, autonomous car alone will generate four terabytes of data per day, per car. It's a really good news for Samsung memory business. <laughs> but it's also a challenge for putting all that data into cloud. So we really have to figure out how to solve this balance between center cloud as well as edge. And to me, there is a tremendous opportunity for new architecture, new way of doing things, and solving some of the very difficult problems. The good news around this intelligence the edge is that Samsung is one of the largest edge companies. We have a lot to add, a lot to bring into this equation. So I think the other thing, as a semiconductor person, I would say, uh, uh, is the really around evolution of microprocessors that we have seen. And we see that CPU has done its work. It has really evolved where we are from really early days of computing to where we are with all the data centers, the, the x86 architecture. And then obviously the GPU has been really great in moving chunk of data at a time. But I think the, um, there is an issue with the power. There is an issue with the cost. And there is issue around efficiency, mainly because the kind of data we are dealing with today is really it's the sparse data, it's the uh, unstructured data, and it's coming streaming data that are coming from all over. So we need to have a new data flow architecture that can be able to address the kind of demand that are required. And we have to invest in this. I know there are several um, companies that out there try to innovate uh, along with Samsung and with Samsung. And I think there is a, a winner to become next few years in this space as well. Um, lastly, I believe that um, there is a tremendous opportunity for companies like us, but companies like you that are working on certain solutions because of the, the unsatiable demand for data that requires the kind of infrastructure investment and the kind of technology that we all have to work on. So we are committed making sure all of our products are edge intelligent, having the connected processor ready, and we are going to invest in a, and the kind of investment we have been doing in a way. We are the largest investor of capital expenditures in R&D, and we'll continue to do that, and we have a commit to spend $160 billion next three years, and also announced that we will reach out to global AI centers to recruit the best people that are out there that can help us to get this journey going. So that's really our commitment. And the, uh, today, I'm really happy to say we have some great speakers that can give more insight around the, the state of the AI by Andrew Ng. Andrew has been really a good friend of Samsung, good friend of me, and help us to really think about AI as not only an opportunity for solving innovation, but it's a corporate opportunities, strategic opportunities to think much broader. Uh, Daphne is going to be discussing around what earlier I talked about, how the boundary of the, uh, a, you know, the um, boundary of IT and biology, how they're coming together. And it's not, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm sure she can give you a lot more insight on this subject. Ellie is going to talk about the, how the, um, the cyber security could be impacted by AI and being able to use technology to address given those challenges. And Regina Dukan is going to talk about some of the innovation subject as well as the um, consequences for AI that we are developing. So I really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.